All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm so happy that you guys can be here today. Um, uh, my name is Savannah. I am one of the Regional Youth of the Year for the Central Region, and I'm also a member of uh, BGC Canada's National Youth Council. And I'm going to get us started off with a land acknowledgement. So we want to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we're on today. Since we're meeting on a virtual platform, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that BGC Canada's national team office is situated in Treaty 13 territory, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it is also the home of many diverse, nation, many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. In my case, I'm coming to you from the Crawford Purchase of 1783, one of the many land agreements made between the Crown and Indigenous peoples. They're also known as the Upper Canada Land Surrenders, which make up what is now known as Ontario. The land was exchanged for clothing, weapons, 12 lace hats, and cloth, and the Mississauga found themselves pushed out of their traditional territory as the loyalists and later settlers took over the land. The irony in this and every other treaty is that although Indigenous people signed as sovereign nations, they immediately came under the jurisdiction of European laws and they were denied them their territory, traditions, and promise benefits. These things continue to affect Indigenous communities to this day. Please join me for a moment and about how we can play a part in educating ourselves and create awareness about the ongoing injustices against Indigenous people. Thank you. And now I will pass it over to uh, President and CEO of BGC Canada, to, Owen Charters. To welcome Mental Health uh, Day, first of all, um, that uh, we do recognize that these conversations sometimes can be very challenging. And we encourage anyone who is feeling unwell and or who might need support to use a private chat uh, with Bonnie Lipton Voss, who you'll see on the, among the participants. She is a, superior, a peer support counselor who is here at the meeting. Bonnie's struggles with chronic health issues and mental health challenges inspired her decision to become a social worker. She brings her authentic whole self when supporting others. What will happen if you need it is that Bonnie can initiate a private breakout room with you. Um, you can also call Kids Help Phone or if you're thinking about suicide, please call 1-833-456-4566, it's toll free, or in Quebec, 1-866-277-3553, which are available 24 seven, or visit crisisservicescanada.ca. Finally, counseling services are also available in Cree, Ojibwe, and Inuktitut on the Hope for Wellness helpline at hopeforwellness.ca. A couple of housekeeping items for those of you joining today. Please stay muted during the session. When we get to the Q&A, uh, the, the, the question and answer session, we will, you can use your raise your hand function and the host will unmute you so you can ask your question. And um, we're also monitoring the chat so you can ask questions there as well. We also have today real-time French translation. So if you'd like to utilize this feature, you can click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's an icon that looks like a globe. If you have any technical issues, please private chat with Jen Turner from BGC Canada who can assist you. Si vous souhaitez utiliser cette fonctionnalité de la traduction, vous pouvez maintenant cliquer sur l'icône d'interprétation qui ressemble à un globe ci-dessous. Si vous rencontrez des problèmes techniques, vous pouvez discuter en privé avec Jen Turner qui peut vous aider. So, with that behind us, I'd like to jump in and say that Mental health was critical to the work that we've done at our clubs across the country prior to the pandemic, and especially during the last 19 months, as we've really refocused on this critical work across the country. Our more than 700 club locations nationwide work to create inclusive spaces where youth can create meaningful, positive relationships and participate in music, theater, science, tech, um, engineering and math, academic supports, trauma-informed sports programming, and more many of which are designed to support their mental wellness. However, these last 19 months have been extremely difficult on the communities that we serve. And we and our panelists organizations also serve many communities and have 
discovered the same problem, I think, over these 19 months. Youth have been isolated. They've lost friends and loved ones to COVID or the ongoing opioid crisis. And they've often been cut off from many of the safe spaces where they could process these emotions with peers and with mentors. Our plan this morning is to rapidly, we hope rapidly, unpack the ongoing youth mental health crisis across Canada to discuss policy and investment prescriptions that are built to tackle a crisis of this magnitude and to take audience questions around program innovation, advocacy, and collaboration. So get your thinking hats on. I know it's very early, especially for those who are west of uh, the Eastern time zone. And we apologize for that. But if you've had your coffee, we are looking for your thoughts and ideas during the question and answer period. But before we move to conversations with our panelists, we're very thrilled that the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions and Associate Mentor, M Minister of Health, Dr. Carolyn Bennett, is here with us this morning and will provide some opening remarks. The Honorable Carolyn Bennett was first elected to the House of Commons in 1997 and has been re-elected since then many times, most recently in 2021, representing Toronto St. Paul's. Minister Bennett previously served as Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs, and Minister of State for Public Health. So Minister Bennett, on behalf of everyone involved today, congratulations first on your new historic position in the federal government. And we really wanna thank you for taking time to join us this morning. We're gonna turn it to you to hear a few opening remarks. Well, uh, thank you, good morning. Um, uh, Ed, I am joining you today from the traditional territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people and I'm very happy to be here today for this discussion on the topic of the health of the young and the young people, as the first minister of health and mental dependence. Um, it, thank you, Owen. Uh, that was um, so, so important. And that, uh, thank you for including me, um, because as, as we've said, we, we've only begun this work uh, as the first uh, the first ever uh, Minister of, of uh, Mental Health and Addictions. Uh, five provinces are ahead of us on this. So, you know, we start with total humility but, and also want to recognize uh, the incredible panelists, uh, Margaret Eaton and Catherine Hay, Jocelyn Formsa and David Willis, uh, 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 friends and people I've, I've known and learned from before, but especially uh, Sydney and Savannah, um, uh, Savannah, thank you for that truly beautiful land acknowledgement. I think it's one of the most beautiful ones I've ever heard that really is about reflection. And, uh, but uh, as the uh, prime minister says, the young people are not only our future, but our present, uh, they're actually our conscience. And, and as I learned through my previous portfolio, nothing about us without us um, also, in women's health, uh, but uh, that we need both those with uh, expertise and those with lived experience in order to develop um, the effective policies and programs. And I just wanna say, I look forward to working with all of you um, to learn about your wise practices, but also to hear about your challenges. Um, as you said on uh, that, we know that youth who were already experiencing poor mental health before COVID-19 were affected and even more by the pandemic. And this was particularly too, true for young people from the 2SLGBTQQIA plus community. And, you know, I, there's nobody on this call that doesn't know the, the, the stats uh, that visible minority groups were also more likely to report poor mental health uh, um, during the pandemic. So we know that young people are suffering. Uh, we know that they're suffering in ways that are unique to them. Um, and we know that top-down solutions don't work. So uh, it is that young people are reaching out for help um, and to you and your organizations. Uh, you've always been there for them, but now we need to listen to you and to them um, to make sure that we are able um, to ensure that the most appropriate timely supports are available in person or as we've learned more recently, virtually. Uh, I have to say last week uh, at the briefing on Wellness Together uh, Canada portal, um, the, I was very impressed at the, the, the flexibility and the, the way that people could browse and, and then if necessary engage and was uh, 
really uh, astounded to say 1.8 million Canadians have already accessed that service and and in its age appropriate setup. And obviously, we're going to need your help at the implementation of 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 commitments we've already made, but also in terms of what what we need to do together, including um, the increasing um, funding for um, support for post-secondary institutions uh, and uh, who and also making sure that the BIPOC community um, is 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 helped and supported in a in a in a, a culturally uh, sensitive way. So it is uh, about you know moving from health care as we said in the Ottawa Charter how many ever decades ago to uh, to systems for health and I think that we can only build systems for health bottom up. So um, determining the next steps is going to take that kind of collaboration, cooperation, but also the applied research to make sure that it's evidence-based policies and practices. We, we need to know what we're doing is working. It's not just making us feel like we're doing something. You, you actually need to know um, that, that young people are feeling supported and are able to give that kind of feedback um, of, of what's working and what's really not working. So I'm very uh, grateful for uh, this morning's conversation. Um, my youth council throughout the pandemic have reminded me that they don't wanna hear any talk about getting back to normal. Um, they, they want us to take what we've learned and build a better future, to leap forward into something way better than we had before. And I think that will come with building the mental health literacy, eliminating the stigma as we build mental health into all of our systems for health. So I will, I'm starting by reaching out to my colleagues in the federal family. We've got to get our act together there. Uh, but, but the pro provincial and territorial counterparts, but to the thinkers and the doers like you, um, as we identify the wise practices and the gaps and the challenges. So I'm gonna need your help. Um, and I look forward to working with all of you. This is uh, we in all humility. Uh, um, um, thank you for including me. Well, Minister, I, I wanna say a huge thank you for, for joining us. Um, we're looking forward to working with you as well. I, mean, I think there's um, so much that uh, advice on, on every topic that the government receives, but, but we know that this is a critical one. Uh, and this is a critical one for a generation that has been so impacted by, by the pandemic uh, and, and a generation that we know will build the future for this country, but they need the support that I know that uh, you and your team will bring uh, as part of this work. So we look forward greatly to working with you. Um, and, and again, really thank you for joining us uh, so early in your mandate. Um, um, and so uh, thank you again. Um, I'm gonna jump to our panelists and uh, we wanna hear from the panelists that we have gathered today. Um, I know there's, they're part of our, our main event in terms of um, I think some of the, the great wisdom they're gonna share. And I'll just introduce you them quickly. Um, they'll, they'll appear on your screen once they start uh, talking and answering some of the questions we've got for you. Um, so today we've got with us Margaret Eaton, who is the national CEO for Canadian Mental Health Association. We've got Catherine Hay, who's the president and CEO for Kids Help Bone. Sydney Jean-Baptiste, who's a member of BGC Canada's National Youth Council. Jocelyn Formsma, who's executive director of the national, national Association of Friendship Centers. And David Willis, director of Toronto's lead agency for child and youth mental health uh, as part of Strides Toronto. So welcome to all of you. Thank you again for joining this morning. Um, we'll, we'll, tr we'll throw some questions to you. Um, I have a few here. We're going to start, um, start with Sydney. Um, and Sydney, I just want to start by simply asking essentially how the last 19 months have been for you and what you've been hearing as a staff and volunteer of one of our clubs in Toronto and, and through the National Youth Council of ours. Uh, essentially, we've seen a lot of headlines over the last 19 months about the youth mental health crisis. And in your experience, would you say that those are accurate? Uh, I think absolutely. Uh, I think the word crisis is sort of representative of the entire issue. Um, because like you were saying, youth mental health has sort of always been important, especially in our clubs, but the pandemic has sort of exacerbated that issue a hundredfold. So uh, for one, we have these youth hold straight out of a lot of their safe spaces, uh, like Caroline is saying, um, and this is especially true for you know 2S and LGBTQ plus youth who uh, 
you know, especially where home isn't always where they feel most comfortable or most safe. Um, and sometimes home can feel very unsafe, uh, depending on the relationship with their family. So a lot of the time they rely on school or places like our clubs or, uh, you know, just their friend groups for that support and lockdown and isolation sort of took that all away from them. Um, and then we had online learning, which didn't help. Like, sure, it's hard to, you know, engage and keep up in classes when everything is virtual, but school is a social place more than almost anything uh and that's where the majority of the social interaction came from and when you know even given opportunities outside of their virtual classrooms uh to connect like you know with our club's virtual programs youth were so sort of zoomed out that you know they didn't want to attend or they just didn't have the energy to uh so they were sort of cut off and isolated uh which we know for youth isn't does not bode well at all. Um, and finally, I think there was a huge issue just accessing mental health services uh, because we had this huge epidemic going on and there was this sort of increase in need uh, around across the board, but services were limited or made virtual uh, because of COVID. So, you know, I had a friend who needed sort of like immediate mental help and I saw firsthand how the system was sort of failing him because there was so many backups or long wait lists or services that were shut down uh, that could have helped him, but you know we're just unavailable because of like funding or staff shortages. Uh, so there's just all of these sort of things that are working against youth right now, um, and I think just our collective mental health is sort of suffering for that. No, definitely stories that I've heard from others across the country. So thank you for for. Um reflecting that. I think both of that's an important uh, direct reflection. And, and I just want to take that and I'm actually turning to you, Kathy, um, because at Kids Help Phone, um, I think you've seen a lot of the impact of this over the last 19 months in, in, from coast to coast to coast. And I just want to understand a bit more about how your experience at Kids Help Phone reflects what Sydney just um, told us about in terms of her experiences. And before I, I let you answer that, I also want to know a bit about what do you think uh, the role of early intervention and prevention um, might be playing in, in, in dealing with an emerging crisis. So Kathy, we'll turn to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Owen and Sydney and Silvana. Thank you both and all the young people across Canada um, because your voice and your courage is helping to shape uh, not only this conversation, but uh, the work we do. Minister, uh, thank you. You've been on the front line of uh, primary care for many, many years prior to public service. Um, there is not much we're gonna talk about today that you either didn't experience yourself on the front lines um, or know about. So maybe let me break it down a little bit. Um, you know, uh, 2020, and we've talked a little bit about it already. Uh, it seems like 20 years ago, it actually is only 20 months ago. And it started rough for the young people across this country. Um, Kids Help Phone sees the impacts of issues or crises that are happening globally almost immediately on our platforms. Um, and that's because people reach out to us, young people reach out to us every single day from the age of about five, a typical day five to about 26 every single day. And um, I want to remind everyone here, uh, well, let's think about 2020. Started with the Australian fires. Kids Help Phones saw a bump up. Then just a few weeks later, and they're digesting, you're all digesting it through uh, social media and news, uh, a plane was shot down and 63 Canadians lost their lives and we saw another bump up. And uh, Kobe Bryant's helicopter crash, uh, actually we saw another bump up on, on our kids' cell phone platforms. Um, and then COVID hit in March. And um, there is no question that uh, um, it was immediate. We saw a 350% increase on our frontline services in the first few weeks. And I want to remind everybody here, in particular those of us working, and Minister, you're working alongside us um, with youth facing, that um, youth were struggling with mental health before COVID. And I think that's really important to remember. Canada has the second uh, or the second highest cause of death for young people in Canada is suicide. We in Canada, a first world 
and I will argue the best country in the world, we have the third highest youth suicide rate in the industrialized world. Uh, Minister, you know this intimately, uh, and we spoke about it, Sydney, you mentioned uh, it very strongly. Indigenous youth and, youth and Black youth are um, proportionately or disproportionately impacted by all of this. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about racism and discrimination in a moment. But let's talk about COVID-19 uh, and the impacts since March of 2020. And you know I'm gonna give some pretty staggering numbers because we are data-driven. Everything we do is, uh, is uh, with the voices of youth driving uh, our decisions through data. Um, so in 2019, it was a busy year and Kids Help Phone would have said to you on this panel, it was tough and we interacted with youth 1.9 million times coast to coast to coast. That was 2019. Since March of 2020, since March, 20 months, uh, Kids Help Phone has interacted with more than 9 million young people since March of 2020. Um, that's 24-7 bilingual, every province and territory. And I will say um, this sector, we can stand up and stand in and we can do enormous work on a shoestring or you know, in the moment of crisis. Our wait times are five minutes or less on average. Um, large issues, small issues. And in those 20 months, kids help phone uh, was involved with more than 7,500, 7,500 active suicide rescues. Um, so those numbers in itself will uh, certainly support what you are saying, Sydney. I want to break it down a little bit more if I have two more minutes or one more minute. Mm -hmm. um, so in there, the needs of young people have changed as well. So baseline was pre-COVID struggling, we're worried about young people. And then uh, COVID with fear and grief and isolation. So uh, those reaching out to kids help phone. First of all, about 48% of people suicide and suicide ideation. So you spoke about, or you asked me um, about uh, prevention and the role of prevention, Owen. Uh, first and foremost, the silver lining here is all the work we do in the not-for-profit charitable sector. The silver lining is that on the other side of a phone, chat, text, gateway to self-directed tools, whatever, uh, there is someone there for the young people of Canada. That is the silver lining, but the bigger, most inspiring silver lining in all of this are the young people themselves because they're reaching out in the numbers that they are and when they can get to service like Kids Help Phone or BGC Canada or Big Brothers Big Sisters or CMHA, um, that is them. That is the young person stepping forward with courage and resiliency. And, um, and I think you know, we should follow the young person. But around prevention, if we can be there then, we will, um, well, we will stop potentially uh, emergency room visits where we don't want young people to be at 2 a.m. with a mental health crisis. We will enable the strength of their resiliency and their coping mechanisms. And those, as a grateful parent to Kids Help Phone, when I see the impact that it had on my daughter, she's a, made me a grandmother now, uh, that empowering prevention uh, moment is life-changing for young people. So I cannot stress enough the work that all of us are doing as youth-facing uh, service organizations for young people in prevention. And then I will stop. My name is Chatty Cathy Chatter, hey. <laughs> um, but I do wanna speak about equity-seeking populations, uh, Black youth and Indigenous youth. As well during COVID, social injustice heated up in an incredible way 
and quite frankly, as it should have after um, uh, the murder of George Floyd and uh, many, many, many tragedies in, in Canada. What we saw at Kids Help Phone uh, uh, about youth reaching out about racism and discrimination, if anyone ever questions that it can't be that big of a deal, we see through our data, through the voice of young people, that those reaching out about racism and discrimination are some of the most distressed texters that we get at Kids Help Phone, second only to young people fearing imminent harm in their own home. And they are also most likely to talk about suicide. So um, I say that to all of us because we're galvanized. We know the work we need to do. Uh, we need to galvanize more. More is better. Patsy, those are some sobering statistics. Um, and this is what I think the story that you tell is really of a, a crisis and multiple tragedies wrapped together in what seems like a, a Gordian knot, unfortunately. And I think that, that that's what we're facing now is, is just issues compounding on each other. Uh, and, and to hear those numbers is, is quite staggering. Um, Jocelyn, I'm going to turn to you, uh, and we've, we've seen that the, the pandemic has really intensified the challenges around the social determinants of health for, for especially urban Indigenous communities, and these th include things from housing to poverty and unemployment to discrimination in the healthcare system and lack of access to services. Uh, can you speak to the importance of some community involvement and Indigenous-led health services for the urban Indigenous community, um, especially obviously as regards to, to mental health? Good morning, Owen. Thank you so much um, for inviting me today. Uh, my name is Jocelyn and I'm from Moose Cree First Nation. I've been living here in Ottawa and Algonquin Territory for on and off about uh, 12 years or so. Um, I did a stint in uh, Anishinaabe Territory uh, while I was practicing law and um, for those who may not know, just really quickly about, um, uh, so I'm the executive director of the National Association of Friendship Centers and our network, um, we have over a hundred uh, local friendship centers and regional uh, provincial territorial associations across the country. We're in every region in Canada from coast to coast to coast. And um, we're essentially um, urban indigenous uh, community hubs. So, uh, depending on what the community needs, friendship centers there are there to provide a wide range of community-driven services. <clears throat> In a nutshell, there's a lot more to it, but uh, I really want to talk about the mental health piece. So what we have um, during the pandemic, certainly, um, we had uh, friendship centers having to pivot quite quickly from in-person, in-the-center services to providing them an on online, um, taking in calls, trying to provide community supports based on what they were hearing um, was needed from the community. Um, and as you mentioned, Owen, um, I mean, mental health doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not just like how, not always about how you're feeling one day to the, to the other, but um, really gets exacerbated by those social determinants that you talked about. What, it's, it's a big term to mean like, do you have shelter? Do you have food? Um, do you have access to the things that you need on a, on a daily basis? And so what we found in terms of mental health is that there are just some things that you can't remedy by a good self-care day, right? Um, there's just some things you can't develop coping skills for. So for example, um, uh, racism. You can, you can develop some pretty good coping skills, but it's really difficult uh, when you're faced with a racist situation to address it in the moment. Um, housing, um, food, having access to food, having access to connectivity, the internet, devices, laptops, and, and things like that. Um, and especially if you're involved in some kind of institution, so the child welfare system, the justice system, um, those types of things really exacerbate what you're experiencing with your mental health, right? And that's not something that a phone number can always call like yes you could talk to somebody about it and they can maybe help you and, and just hear what you're saying but at the end of the day um, if you don't have a place to live or you're struggling to find um, <clears throat> uh, supports then um, 
you know, what do you, what are your, what are your options, especially as a young person? Um, so what we found and what we've been trying to do um, is to kind of build out those community supports. Um, one of the biggest things that we saw with um, challenges with isolation is, is that longing for connection, like just wanting to not just talk to somebody, but um, feeling like you're a part of a community, feeling like you're supported, like even though today is really bad or I'm not feeling very well today, um, that it's gonna be okay because there's a system and there's a community of support that's around you. Um, another challenge sometimes that indigenous young people face and anybody who's indigenous, um, is also like when you call the number who are you going to get on the other line and is this somebody that I'm going to have to explain who I am in my situation in order to get culturally relevant supports right um, I know just personally um, when accessing mental health care um, I've been asked if I have a history of mental illness or uh, depression in my family and even though it was never diagnosed, um, sometimes I say, well, my mom went to residential school. And if the person that I'm talking to on the other line doesn't know what that means and doesn't know the implications of what I just said, and I have to spend time explaining that uh, to somebody who's supposed to be helping me, then it's really hard um, to, to build the trust that I need with that person to be able to get the kinds of mental health supports that I need. Um, I'm hoping we're going to get to a little bit more in, in some of the Q&A, but um, I think I'll just leave off with, with these few points. Um, <clears throat> so I wrote down three words, the same word over and over. It's culture, culture, culture. Um, one of the ways that we have been able to uh, properly and adequately support Indigenous young people is through culture. Um, it's one of the biggest things that draw people to services and supports. And I can't tell you, like I follow probably as many friendship centers as I can on Facebook. And right now, the amount of culture camps that are happening because this is a hunting season, people are out there harvesting, um, that they have so many young people coming to participate in that programming that's on the land, um, access to knowledge keepers, access to culture and learning about something that their ancestors have done for, for millennia, right? Um, and that's going to be so much more successful than, hey, why don't you come to this mental health, you know, if you call anything mental health, um, it might not be as successful, but um, if you call it like we're doing on the land culture camp, um, that brings out a lot of young people. Um, and I think uh, anything that's going to be worth um, or anything that's going to be very successful is is going to be community driven. So it's not just sort of a, a, a model that we've taken from somewhere else. It's um, young people uh, determining for themselves what they need and then having the support from folks like us to just make it happen, right? Whether that's space, whether that's uh, resources, whether that's people, whether it's just somebody to come help out, set up chairs and put out some drinks and some snacks, right? Like that's, that's really, I think what we can do is listen to the young people and then provide the support around what they're saying. And I will never discount the power of of joy. <clears throat> so a lot of times we're, we, we come from a deficit mindset, um, thinking like, okay, you're ill, we have to help you, we have to save you, we have to, you know, give you this thing, and then it'll make you better. Um, but if we just kind of create spaces that um, joy can naturally occur, um, I feel like that's a big power, big powerful piece of, of gaining connection and, and making people maybe they are having a hard day and that's not going to get better, you know, today or tomorrow. But for a few minutes, um, you made me feel happy and joyful and that was enough to get me through today and that's enough to get me through tomorrow. So thank you so much. Awesome, thank you. And I think there's not enough to be said about those moments of joy and, and taking the, the time to celebrate those pieces. But also I think culture and connection, um, those echo a lot of what we, we heard from, from Sydney as well in terms of the loss of those, those places of connection. So thank you um, um, for that. I, I wanna turn to you, Margaret. Um, and Margaret, uh, 
uh, just a reminder for everyone is, is with the Canadian Mental Health Association, but um, mental, health, mental health policy engagement, it can be difficult, but it's also a jurisdictional challenge. It's a bit of a hot potato at times. Uh, but I, I think we're saying this is a problem that's bigger than all of us and does need does need government. Um, what would you what would you say? First of all, I'd love to hear just your reaction to how the pandemic has impacted um, youth mental health. Uh, but secondly, how how you are starting to see how governments need to respond and what you think some of the description around that might be. Thank you so much, Owen, and uh, my fellow panelists. And thank you so much, Dr. Bennett, for joining us today for this really important conversation. Uh, CMHA is in 330 regions across Canada. And similarly, the phones have been ringing off the hook um, with parents and young people calling in to try to get support. And we have waiting lists. It's been very difficult to meet those needs, but we have in many ways successfully pivoted through the pandemic uh, to try to support as many uh, parents and children and youth as we can. But it has been tough and there are issues around chronic underfunding. And our, one of our larger concerns now is um, what Dr. Bennett mentioned, this idea of do we go back to normal? Um, we know that the pandemic is going to have we're all, you know, back to normal place. Um, we made mental health of this pandemic, and we expect that there will be a long-term impact. So we know from our experience, for example, after the Fort McMurray fires, our CMHA in Fort McMurray found that people were coming to the association two years after they had returned to the community. So there will be, in some cases, a PTSD effect, and we're concerned that young people will, will be a lost generation, that they've lost so much through this pandemic and are truly feeling the effects of it. So while the federal government has provided some short-term supports around mental health, which we truly appreciate, especially for vulnerable populations, we would love to see a longer term systems change. I was so pleased Dr. Bennett spoke to this, that it is a bottom up kind of systems change. So we talk a lot at CMHA about universal mental health care, which is a big, big ask country. And it's something that the United So unfortunately in our current method of funding, the federal government provides the largest share of mental health care funding through the, uh, the health transfers. Um, but um, a lot of that, uh, that funding is earmarked for psychiatrists and hospitals. It doesn't fund the kind of work that we see being done around this table. It doesn't fund the community approach to mental health, which is oftentimes what keeps people from ending up in a hospital. So we would love to see more investment in the kinds of community organizations that are filling the gaps in this patchwork quilt of a mental health care system that we have. You know, it's part private, it's part public, it's part community, and in a lot of cases, people fall through the gaps. So if we had universal mental health care, we could imagine that there would be long-term and consistent funding for community organizations that provide mental health support, and that these would be long-term sustained investments. And it would be based on what programs and services are actually delivering results, as the minister said. It must be data-based and, and evaluated. We'd also like to see a larger investment in virtual mental health services. We saw the impact that virtual can have through the pandemic. It can be quite effective. And we know that there are huge issues for rural and remote communities, which are not getting the kinds of support that you would get if you lived in, in a larger community. So we want to break down that disparity and we think virtual mental health might be the thing. We also want to see mental health promotion and illness prevention, which is so often delivered at the community level. Uh, we know that 70% of mental health problems begin in childhood and adolescence, and those issues will only be exacerbated through the pandemic. And so looking at things like school-based approaches, such as social and emotional learning programs, could be a very effective approach to getting at the largest group of children and youth through, um, through curriculum-based programming. 
We would also want to see a substantial increase in Indigenous-led Indigenous mental health. We know that Indigenous peoples have suffered, just as Jocelyn was saying, from um, residential schools, ongoing racism, and the impact of trauma that is intergenerational. And we would love to see a much larger investment in that area to ensure that Indigenous issues can be addressed so that Indigenous people can take on the leadership role that they need uh, to support all of us as uh, Canadians. Um, we would also like to see counseling and psychotherapy be publicly funded. Um, this is something that happens in the United Kingdom. If you have depression and anxiety, you can go to a local health center and get free care for depression and anxiety. Um, there are huge waiting lists and parents uh, have complained about the fact that they can't get the kind of psychotherapy that their children need in a timely manner. Um, kids need help right away. I was so delighted to hear that Catherine said there's a five minute wait uh, to, to speak with a counselor at Kids Help Phone. We need that kind of instant support for children and young people that we just don't have right now. And it has to be affordable at $100 or more per hour. Um, a few hours of therapy is not going to do it. it. It needs more intense care and treatment. I could go on and on, but that's the beginning of what we think a universal mental health care system might look like. And we look forward to working with all of you to make that a reality. I feel like we heard about the Gordian knot of all the challenges, and now we're hearing about the patchwork that needs to be, I think, smoothed over and built into some more universal system. So I, I really appreciate that, Margaret. It, it's very helpful. Um, David, uh, I, I hate to turn to you as the last panelist, but, but I, I do want to hear it from you um, in, in heading up Toronto's lead agency for child and youth mental health. Um, you see firsthand at, at, a, at a city level some of the possibilities and the gaps in the system. I think some of the things that you just heard about from, from Margaret, and I'm interested in terms of what you think some of the, the right kinds of investments that need to be made in, in programs and government pieces, et cetera. So uh, love to hear that from you. Uh, Owen, thanks, uh, Minister Bennett and panelists. Really pleased to be a part of this. Um, and you know what? I could probably take hours and I would just be scratching the surface of these questions. So I'm going to I'm going to do a bit of a local focus and then sort of move out from there a little bit. And so I think, you know, if we talk about Toronto, right, complex, glorious, uh, some say a hot mess. Um, but you know what? I, I think of it as a meeting place for the world. And with that comes complexities that, uh, while appearing to be Toronto-centric, can actually be extrapolated and applied across the country. So let's, let's think about a couple of facts. 16% of youth 18 to 24 in the GTA reported that they had thought about suicide over the past three months. That's 55,000 youth thinking about suicide in the last three months. Now Nationally, that rate is about, I think, about 6.3, which is about 270,000 youth. And it's even worse when we talk about the LGBTQ2S populations, and they show about 16.8%, or about 168,000 people have thought about suicide. We know that many youth have experienced traumatic changes in their daily lives because of the pandemic, from parents and unemployment or employment issues, social isolation, and for some, this means being in an unsafe place for prolonged periods of time. So PTSD often won't appear until months after a traumatic event, with 28% of Torontonians showing persistent levels of high anxiety during the pandemic. This is a harbinger of what's to come. We know that those who live below $20,000 of annual income have disproportionately higher levels of depression. 32% of these folks are saying that they have moderate or severe depression. That equates to hundreds of thousands of people across the country, and they're actually suffering right now. So that's a huge challenge for us. So when we think about it, our challenge is now to prepare and be ready for the when. When we may start seeing the dramatic increases in suicide attempts, they're here now. When the mental health emergency room visits go way up, that's happening now. Explosions in eating disorders, that's happening now. Minor anxiety and depression becoming serious and life-threatening, it's happening now. So when we see dramatic increases on the economic impacts to our country, that's happening now and will only get worse. Currently, it's about $51 billion a year in economic impact because of mental health. 
When we see the great potential of children and youth diverted because mental health issues and the lack of supports for them, for many of the things I've just listed, we are seeing now. So what are we doing and what should we be doing and what can we do better? This is kind of what we focus on on a daily basis at the lead agency. So it, it feels good that I can sort of share these things. Um, you know, as providers of treatment to infants, children, youth, and families, we're working incredibly hard to build a system that's a resource for all, that provides the right care at the right time, at the right place. And this isn't a local issue. This is a national opportunity. It crosses boundaries, be it community, local, provincial, national. We have historically been very siloed in our thinking, in our service delivery, and in our strategic planning. And we need to look up, and we need to look across, and we need to see each other. We need to build partnerships. We need to build pathways that promote the best that we do so there's continuity in our delivery of clinical care so that treatment you access in BC and Alberta is the same quality and approach in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. We do this in some wonderful ways, and there are people on this call right now who are doing this brilliantly, but I think it's the exception and we have to make it the norm. And we also need to hold children, youth, and their families at the center of all of our planning, keeping a laser focus on them and their needs and not us as providers. And what does that mean? <laughs> For starters, it means a revolution in the way we collect information, data, the way we share that information, and ultimately, the way we use that information for system planning. An example, so if you think about it, in downtown Toronto in a 15 square block area, there's over a hundred ministry funded mental health programs, just mental health, and none of these systems talk to each other. None of them allow a client or a family to only tell their story once. And then now let's think about adding in primary care, hospitals, education, wellness, the list is pretty long and it creates confusion, anxiety, frustration, and ultimately creates massive barriers to the care we're desperately trying to plan and provide. Investment in the technology and skill to deliver a cohesive system that holds the client at the center would improve our ability to provide essential mental health care, increase accountability and quality, drive down costs, increase efficiency, and support better outcomes. We're trying to, we are creating more and more virtual opportunities to deliver care. The pandemic showed us we can do this. We can't run away from this. We know that face-to-face -face care is the best care that we can provide. We also know that in the absence of face-to-face, -face, virtual is as good as. We saw the incredible pivot to virtual care that took place at the start of the pandemic. That would never have happened without, a, without the crisis that we're currently in, never. So our challenge is not to retreat from, that, from the incredible gains that we've made as we pivot back to face-to-face -face care. Hybrid models are being delivered that combine virtual and in-person care, group therapies across vast geographic uh, areas, integration of medical, prescription, diagnostic imaging, psychiatry, clinical counseling, and other services like that need to be bundled and made available to everyone. An important challenge within this area of care is to ensure that those who lack access to technology are given that access as part of their care. Technology removes geography as a barrier. It also enables partnerships like never before. We also need to invest in our clinicians. There's one mental health agency that I know of in the North that has over a hundred vacancies for clinical positions, a hundred. We're at a crisis point in our recruitment and retention of qualified mental health clinicians in this country. What we need to do is to support our clients and families by investing in more clinical capacity, a great workforce that can address the overwhelming demands that are here now and in the very near future. In particular, we need to address the absence of our equity deserving communities in the planning and delivery of mental health services. Indigenous Métis Inuit programming, particularly around the areas of intensive mental health services, which are live-in treatment, day treatment, intensive in-home services, they need massive investments to support these communities and the youth in a way that is safe for them and is designed and delivered by them. Racialized communities and new Canadians are not represented well in our delivery of care. We don't see them in the people that we, that we receive care from. So we need a national strategy to build that capacity to equalize the disparities between sectors and regions and to quit competing for talent. Community mental health is a cornerstone to healthy, thriving communities. And if we're gonna tackle the after effects of this pandemic and be prepared for the next one, 
We need to be thinking in the immediate, the near and the long-term so that we're confident that we can continue to support the kids. And I think maybe I'll stop there. Thanks, David. I, I really appreciate this. The, the, the statistics add um, sadly to what we heard from, from Kathy, but then I think the challenges that, that uh, are the compounded pieces of, of this really shattered um, um, system of delivering mental health is, is critical and thinking about um, client-centered work is, is going to be vital in terms of, of where we head. And I think that's where we, we need to, to start now. We, we only have a bit of time. I think um, it was great to hear from everyone and I, I have a probably a thousand follow-up questions, but we do wanna allow people who, who are attending today to also ask questions of our panelists. And, and you can do that by raising your hand um, or putting a, a, a question in the chat. Um, I would also say that the questions are for the panelists. I know there's always a temptation when you've got a government minister uh, participating to ask them questions, but uh, I just remind everyone that the minister here is an observer today to, to learn from us um, and, and being new in the portfolio. Um, the questions are too directed to our panelists and, and to hear from them. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, and if you have a question, please don't hesitate to, to raise your hand um, um, in, in in the Zoom um, or, or to put it in the chat and we can forward those to the panelists. So I think we've got um, Sadia. I'll probably take you off mute. Hang on a second. Hi, Hi, my name is Sadia and my question is, what is one tangible action the federal government can take over the first 100 days of this new parliament to start addressing our youth mental health crisis? Thank you. So I'm just gonna to turn to our panelists. I, I, it's a bit of an open session. Um, I don't know if there's someone who wants to jump in on that first. Kathy. Thank you so much, uh, Saudia, for the question. It's an important one. Um, and respectfully, I, I do want to say in the first hundred days, the start has already happened. And, um, and I appreciate all of the conversation today. What I want to impress upon us all and Minister Bennett um, is this government has to continue the investment and double down on it. Um, not uh, uh, tail it off, so to speak, because the tail end of COVID, as we all know, is um, is in uh, uh, mental health. There's no vaccine for the tail end of COVID, actually. Um, and I do want to use the word continue because the investment this government has made in um, Wellness Together Canada, Kids Health Fund is one of the joint venture partners. That's a big investment that is national. Um, and so I, I do a shout out for that, but at the end of the day, this government needs to turn to youth and the mental health uh, system uh, and double down on it. Is there anyone else from the panel who'd like to take, offer an answer as well? I, I could definitely uh, awesome. jump in. I think um, Minister Bennett knows um, probably what I'm about to say better than anybody because we've had conversations about it. But jurisdiction, somebody mentioned it earlier, jurisdiction shouldn't impede uh, someone's ability to access service. And, and for urban Indigenous people, um, a lot of times um, we get kind of... Uh, punted back and forth between federal and provincial responsibility on on different things and so I think um, the uh, ability to navigate uh, on the part of the federal government what they will take as part of responsibility and then negotiating with the provinces what what they will take is is going to go a long way um, but also knowing that regardless there's a role uh, for the federal government to play with with urban indigenous service delivery and to work with folks that will make sure that that happens um, I think uh, yeah I, I think I'll leave that at there because uh, I mentioned everything else around community service delivery but would echo that and um, I think we've had a couple of um, things in place about community service organizations Owen and I have been working together on a on a group that's actually been trying to innovate and, and 
make sure that when people are calling and people are showing up to our buildings, uh, there's somebody to answer the phone and answer the door. Um, so if community service organizations disappear, so do a lot of the supports that um, young people um, turn to when, when they need support. That's great. And Margaret, I saw you had your hand up, and I just, I'm going to, there's a second question for panelists that's just come in as well. So I'll just get your, put your thinking hats on. Uh, we might have time to answer this one as well, but it, it says essentially where, where do we see opportunities for innovation in the field of youth mental health and well-being? And as part of that, what would our agencies want to be doing? What would we like to attempt that we currently aren't doing or can't do? Um, so Margaret, as you answer that, maybe you also want to be thinking about um, um, what else could we be innovating around and doing? So I'll turn to you. Thanks so much. Um, we're very excited by the Canada mental health transfer that was promised in the Liberal platform. And so in the first 100 days, we'd be delighted to see consultations begin on that. And really broad ranging consultations would be what we would ask for to ensure that community mental health is represented. All the people around this table would have wonderful things to say about what should be in uh, a mental health transfer and how might that work. Um, so we're very excited about that. Uh, on innovation, um, we're very proud of our CMHA Kamloops that has uh, a program called Foundry, which is for youth mental health. And it's an integrated mental health services for children from 12 uh, to youth up to 24 uh, that provides a, a whole person and whole family approach to mental health care. So we know there are great things happening on the ground and we look forward to sharing those on the ground community experiences. Are there others who just, as I think is a last question that we may be able to, to spend time on, are there other things your agencies would want to do as well um, as we go around the group? And this is probably our last chance as we start to run out of time. So if you can think of those or, or if you think of others that are doing interesting things, I know we've heard about jurisdictions like the UK where interesting work is being done um, or interesting funding for some of the, that first frontline work. Um, we'd love to just hear your, your final thoughts so anyone can, can jump in. Well, you left it open and I'm always <laughs> to know, you know that, um, but I do want to pull that vein of innovation through here. And, um, and I think when you overlay virtual care and Kids Health Phone is a pioneer in virtual care, if you overlay it on primary care and community hubs, uh, I think there's an opportunity to fill gaps. Um, it's not the solution. It's a gap filler and it is a, uh, an incredible uh, prevention tool, in, in my uh, opinion. Kids Help Phone, the only way we could have managed 9,000 interactions since, or 9 million interactions since March 2020 is we actually put the gas down or the foot on the gas pedal on our innovation agenda and launched multiple new uh, programs and access points um, for Indigenous communities, Black youth, peer-to-peer um, -peer communities. So I um, reinforce the need for innovation in this space to fill gaps. Um, and I think uh, those of us in the not-for-profit charitable youth-facing groups, uh, we are masters at innovation. Um, on a shoestring. Indeed, and I really hate the fact that we, you know, that these are all time dependent and we're running out of that. Um, can I turn to you, Sydney, just as you opened us up and I, I just wonder if you might offer a last word as, as, as a youth panelist in terms of where you see uh, some of this headed and, and maybe some words for, for where you hope we're headed in terms of addressing this. For sure. Um, I think like Catherine was saying, a lot of this is about filling gaps. And I think one of the biggest ones is that, you know, these mental health professionals aren't really integrated into the community as like teachers or some of our club staff or uh, so they don't know our youth and our youth don't really know them. And I, I think that's a lot of where the issue lies, especially around stigma and um, and erasing that and I think work has to be done there for sure because a lot of the time we have youth who are going through some serious very real trauma um, and the only people that they see to go to are you know friends or or you know teachers or club staff and like I know I had a, a, a member from from Palestine who was just sort of distraught about what was going on with the war and, and was going through so much because she felt that she had to educate everyone around her. And I, I felt that I could definitely relate to that um, when 
Black Lives Matter protests were at its peak. And I felt like, you know, every day I was just like on social media or looking for posts or like, I felt that, you know, this huge responsibility was on my shoulders. And that was very real trauma that, you know, they should have been able, or that we both should have been able to, you know, reach out to someone for, but because of who was in the community and who we saw, um, I think there's a, a disconnect between some of these services and uh, the youth that need it. So I think just sort of expanding those services and then incorporating them into their day-to-day -day lives so that they see this professional as not just someone who's sort of disconnected or there if you need them, but someone who's like integrated into the community um, and someone that they, they know and can trust. So that would be my, uh, my take on it. Sydney, thank you. This has been hugely informative. It's um, even as we all work in this space, I think hearing these different perspectives is so valuable because we hear about some of the real issues, not just in terms of the challenges the youth are facing, but the challenges the system is facing. Uh, a system that I think is doing many, many things and trying to respond in all sorts of ways, but we're, we're learning about the fracturing of that system and, and how it's had to cope with a very different load. Uh, over the last 19 months. So it's been uh, very enlightening to me. I hope it's been enlightening to all of you in terms of those issues, um, the issues of many services being in some places, but not connected uh, and issues in, in other places of services not always being appropriately appropriate for the culture um, or, or creating the space, the safe space and connection that's needed. So I think there's lots to be taken away from this. Um, I promise to all of you that this group um, that you see in front of you uh, is a group that together we, we hope to keep working um, jointly on, on building stronger mental health programming across the country uh, and, and working with all levels of government. This is not just a, a responsibility for the federal government, as, as the minister will know. Um, it's, it's about creating those intersections and really creating the, 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 a system that works for everybody. So I think you'll be hearing more and more uh, into next year as we do this work. And if you're interested in joining some of the conversation that I think will continue, um, um, individually or as youth organizations, please don't hesitate. We're going to share um, um, our director of research and public policy's email, Josh Berman, uh, jberman at bgccan.com. Um, his email is now in the chat. So you can, you can please drop him a note uh, if you're interested in being part of this continued conversation. I am deeply apologetic that we didn't have more time today because I felt like we just got started in this conversation. Um, perhaps that what, is, what it also feels like when you own a new portfolio in, in a cabinet in, a, in, a, a in what I think is a strong signal of support for this, this critical issue. And so it's fantastic uh, that all of us are, um, um, we've been on a very long journey over the last 19 months, um, but it does feel like there's some, some new hope in terms of what we can do. So I want to thank everyone again uh, for joining us this morning. Um, especially for those who are uh, further west of the Eastern time zone and felt this was very, very early. So I hope that you had st um, some strong caffeine and, and coffee available to you to, for this. Uh, and we appreciate you joining us. Um, and if there's anything, of course, at any time, don't hesitate to, to connect with any of the panelists um, or with us. And we look forward to hearing from people. And thank you again for joining us this morning. So from all the panelists and from us here at BGC Canada, thank you again. Take care, everyone. Thank you.